with me. Job, right in the middle of your Bible is Psalms. Right before Psalms, you'll find the book of Job. And we're not going to go through verse by verse, but kind of uh, jumping through some things just to uh, get some good lessons for us. We're going to be in Job chapter 8 tonight. Job chapter 8. Most of you are familiar with the basic story in the book of Job, but we miss so much in it. And sometimes if you're just reading your Bible through, you read through and all you hear is these two guys fighting with each other back and forth, and, and that's really what they are. Uh, if you weren't here last Sunday night, I talked about the necessity, uh, how important it is that we be careful with our words. Um, if you want to just go the couple of chapters before, we're going to be in chapter 9, but if you go back to chapter 4, Eliphaz uh, Job's just grieving. They spent seven days fasting and praying and this broken. And then Job in verse three, or chapter three, Job just, he just starts talking. And sometimes it's best if we don't talk. Um, just sometimes it's best to be quiet. And uh, now some of you that never talk, your spouse would like you to talk a little bit. Um, anyway, some of you that always talk. Okay, but anyway. So a life is, Job kind of provokes a life is. So in chapter four, then a life is, it's him that, so he, he just goes ranting and raving for chapter four and chapter five. And you've got to be careful. These guys were good men. These are good men, men that cared. They spent seven days sitting with their friend fasting. I'm not sure anybody in this room has ever done that. And so we're not talking about bad men, but good people can get off. And especially when you start trying to figure things out. We'll look at some of that. So for two chapters, life is he just kind of gets off. Then chapter six, well, now Job, uh, Job's defending himself. So chapter six and chapter seven, uh, Job is, um, you know, he's now he's arguing. And it's getting heated that the, the temperature is rising and the words are being thrown back and forth. And Job's outnumbered three to one. And so while life is talking, Job's listening, but so, does Bill, so is Bill dad. And, 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 and it's, just, it's just a very difficult, difficult time. And so um, they got provoked. And uh, we ought to be so very careful. We talked last week. Don't ever try to figure out why somebody's hurting. Romans 12 gives you a clear direction. Rejoice with them that rejoice and weep with them that weep. Nobody ever minds if you cry for them and just care. And a phone call, a visit, um, uh, prayers, but how careful we need to be. So we're going to step in with this, the next problem, chapter 8. All right, look there with me. And uh, I'm just going to leave you seated. We're going to start right here. Job chapter 8, verse 1. Then answered Bildad the Shuhite. He's the shortest man in the Bible, right? Everybody knows that story. He's the Shuhite. And uh, how long, he says in verse 2, how long wilt thou speak these things? And how long shall the words of thy mouth be like a strong wind? You're just full of hot air. He's just insulting him. And let's pray. Father, help us tonight as we look at your book for a few minutes. And these are better men than us, I would guess, at least in many ways. We know Job, you said, was perfect and upright. I don't know that you've said that about any of us. And so we don't want to come to the scriptures with an accusing uh, attitude. We don't want to join the critics of the life as and Bildad. And, and uh, we, just, we just come asking you to help us learn. Help us learn how to handle the unusual and the difficult and the hurting in a way as Jesus would please. We ask it in his name, amen. Um, looking there at chapter eight, uh, if you look at verse three, doth God pervert judgment or doth the almighty pervert justice? Now, isn't that a good question? God doesn't do anything wrong. God, God is not unfair to you. God is not unjust to me. And so you'll, you'll see the dangerous step and something that the devil does when, when Jesus is being tempted in the wilderness, the devil said, um, if you're hungry, make these stones and be made bread and on and on. But when Jesus answered with the Bible, then the devil quoted. 
He takes him up to the top of the, the pinnacle of the temple and he says, go ahead and jump off because Psalms 91, he'll give his angels charge concerning thee. He'll bear, they'll bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. Don't you think the devil can give you a little bit of truth? He said to Eve in the Garden of Eden, uh, can you eat of everything? Well, yeah, everything but that one. We can't eat that one. And if we eat that one, we'll die. Oh, no, you're not going to die. And uh, boy, the devil will take a little bit of truth and he begins to twist it and begins to, and if you're not careful, you'll follow that. The, a the average critic starts with a little bit of truth. The, the slander, the criticism, the assault, you listen to any of the, the hearings that go on in, uh, in Washington, any of the congressional hearings, the, the biggest liars in the world always lace it with truth. I mean, you believe this, don't you? And I, I think, you know what? If it came out of your mouth, I don't believe it. If you said God is good, I would be sure it was not true. And uh, man, the liars, anyway, there. But that's just, I'm, I've become a cynic a little bit. <laughs> But in verse 3, he asks a very a simple and honest question we'd all answer yesterday. Look down at verse 22. Verse 22. They that hate thee shall be clothed with shame, and the dwelling place of the wicked shall come to naught. Well, we would believe that. Evil's not going to get rewarded, and wrongdoing is not going to get paid back. And, and so he starts and ends this 20-verse this rant with, with something that, how do you not agree with that? But look at the spirit that comes in between. So he says, now he jumps from verse three, does God pervert judgment? Does the almighty pervert justice? Verse four, if thy children have sinned against him and he has cast them away for their transgression. What, a, what an evil thing. Now I'll just say this, as soon as somebody becomes a critic of the dead, you know they're corrupt. You know, there was a day in America when it was like saying your mother wears army boots. It was one of those colloquialisms. You don't speak evil of the dead. We love it today because brainless cowards, they love to attack dead people because they can't defend themselves. And we see that here in the life of Bildad. And, but look at the, the three ifs there in verse 4. If thy children. In verse 5, if thou would seek God. In verse 6, if thou wert pure and upright. And the, uh, the attack on Job's children in verse 4. And they're all dead. Who, you know, you go to a, I've done so many funerals over the years and often. Uh, a funeral for someone I didn't know. And I've told mortuaries, somebody needs a pastor, somebody in our staff, we'll try to help. And, and um, funerals for people that I only met when they were in a coma. And we've done that kind of a thing. And you know, who would, who would stand up and say, you know, this person's dead because they were bad? What kind of evil thing would make you say that? We better be so very guarded at our at our, uh, our assault in the way we handle things. So in verse four, he's, insult, he's assaulting Job's children. In verse five, if you, thou would seek God and make thy supplication to the Almighty, you know, you got a problem because you're not seeking God. You know where Job chapter one starts? With Job worshiping and making sacrifices to God if by chance one of his kids is messed up. This is a godly man. It's a godly man, and they knew better. But you know, once the spirit of slander and once the spirit of bitterness gets inside you, and oh, you better be so careful because Hebrews says, looking diligently lest any root of bitterness spring up trouble you, it troubles you, and then thereby many be defiled. And that thing gets inside, and it can get inside the best of Christians, and pretty soon, you wake up in the morning bitter and you go to bed bitter. And throughout the day, it's, it's like the, the guys, they found this old, this uh, drunken guy passed out and they were just playing a prank and they got Limburger cheese and they rubbed it all over his three-day growth of beard. And, and then they left him there, passed out, and he woke up. He said, man, this whole, this bar stinks. And he walked outside. He said, this street stinks. He walked down the street. He said, man, this whole, the whole world stinks. 
That's an easy thing to do right here. You're bringing the stink with you. If everybody else is loving and, and enjoying and being, being blessed and encouraged and, and, and the stink is everywhere you look, maybe you need to get some Limburger off your face, all right? But the, they, they came with the accusations and um, the, the tragedy of attacking these people. And so that's where Bildad goes. And he just basically is slandering Job. Go to chapter 9. Back to Job now. Uh, Job answers. And, and again, what a dangerous thing. Remember Proverbs? Answer not a fool according to his folly. There are people you have no business responding to. Just walk away. Um, when, when I'm out soul winning, if somebody wants to argue with me, I'll just say, have a great day. I'll walk away. Um, uh, early, the first, before our church even started, I was soul winning with a guy who's a big old rough truck driver, and he was rough, very rough on the edges. He'd never met, his wood had never met sandpaper. And uh, we knock on this door, and, I, and, and again, our town was small then, really small. And, uh, and I tried to give him a track. He said, no, thanks. It, and he kind of saluted. We'll see you later, fellas. And I'm just going to walk away. I don't care. But the guy that was with me said, we'll see you in hell. I thought, well, number one, I'm not going to see nobody in hell. You can go to hell and see him. I'm not going to. Well, why do you say something like that? But this made him mad. This guy wouldn't take a track. And I went, don't punch him or nothing. Come on. There's other houses on the street. And he was mad the whole rest of the time we're out soul winning. <laughs> but anyway, but for the grace of God, you could be a truck driver, right, Bill? Uh, Bill Smith spent his life driving, and somehow he came out with grace. But he got Sandy. That's the, that was his, his, he got Jesus and Sandy. But chapter 9, then Job answered, oh, be careful. And he began, look at verse 16. He, he began to pour out his complaint And in verse 16, if I had called and he, meaning God, had answered me, yet would I not believe that he'd hearkened unto my voice? Uh, He said, I I just don't know if I believe it. If God answered me, this thing is so bad. If I asked God why and he told me, I I don't know if I believe it anyway. My hurt is so deep. If God showed up and explained it to me, I'm not sure. I would, I would grab it. Look at verse 17. For he, he's talking about God now, for he breaketh me with a tempest and multiplieth my, work, my wounds without cause. Now, it's a dangerous thing when you start defending yourself before God. Remember back in chapter 2, God said to Satan, you moved me against him without cause. So God said, there's no reason to do this to Job. But Job shouldn't be saying there's no reason to be doing this. You see the difference there? It, it's, uh, I remember my cousins, they'd fight all the time. Mike, Jamie, and Ronnie, and my brother and I, there was three years between the five boys. And, and uh, what a thing to do to my mom and her sister to give us five boys. But, but uh, I remember one time we were in Iowa visiting them, and the youngest boy, Ronnie, is a few months younger than me. He was in a fight with one of the kids, and we're all just down around watching it's not a big deal. Well, the other guy kind of got the upper hand. And so my middle cousin, James, he just walks over and just kicks the guy in the side. Bam! And knocks him off. Then we walk back. We just wanted to even it a little bit. <laughs> what a mess the world is. But it's okay. Now, now, Mike and Jamie wouldn't have minded beating on Ron, but they didn't want this other guy to beat on Ron. And God will speak well of you. But God doesn't want you speaking well of you. Let another man praise thee, Proverbs says, and not thine own lips. Uh, you, you should be very guarded when you start talking about how good you are or how well you've done. Uh, let another man praise thee. If the whole world talks about how good you are, don't believe it. And, uh, but, but there's, and that's where Job was. He's in this mess, and in verse 17 he breaketh me with a tempest and multiplieth my wounds without cause. He will not suffer me to take my breath, but filleth me with bitterness. And we could sit and be critical of Job, but you've never been where he's been. You've never hurt so bad you can't breathe. You've never hurt so bad that you're, 
that you just are, you're in anxiety and the grief and the sorrow is unbelievable. What, Paul, what uh, Job has been through here, just tragic, tragic troubles. Go down to verse 19. If I speak of strength, lo, he's strong. And of judge, if of judgment, who shall set me a time to plead? If I justify myself, my own mouth shall condemn me. If I say I'm perfect, it shall also prove me perverse. You, you, can't, you can't step up to God and, and say, let me explain how good I've been because my very words will betray me. And Job, Job's still thinking right. He says, I can't even defend myself. How would you like to be where some of these politicians are when they're being investigated by every organization on the planet? I look at them, I think they're, you know what, they may not be saved, but they, they've got more grit than I do. I just say, I'm guilty. Just throw me in a hole and bury me. I'd rather be there than, um, do, do any of us want someone looking into every single thing we've done since high school? And then amplifying it across society? And Job, Job just says, if I, if, if uh, in, in verse 19, if, if I talk about I've been strong and I've stood for right, what a dumb thing to say to God who made the world. You're not that strong. If I were to say in verse 20, uh, if I justify myself, I explain why I did the right thing and this shouldn't be happening to me. How many hundred reasons could God give you for your hurt? No, there shouldn't be any wrong happen to any of us. But yes, any amount of wrong could happen and God has got all the reason in the world. You know, if I got what I deserved right now, I'd go straight to hell. If I got what I deserved, my wife and family would leave me and I'd have no church to pastor. Um, let's be very guarded about this thing. There's none righteous. All of our righteousness, Isaiah 64, 6 says, all of our righteousness is as filthy rags. And, and what we're watching here is a progression of a man who was right. And, and, and God allowed him to be broken and he spends these seven days with his friends broken. And then they begin debating the righteousness of God and whether he deserved to have these things happen. And when, when we start thinking, I've not been treated fairly, we are on very dangerous footing because we've all been treated better than we deserve. I've been treated better than I deserve. You've been treated better than you deserve. And I remember... Just stories after story, we go around the room of people who've been done wrong in business, business partners robbing, uh, people running off with all the money and leaving the, the bills with the other partner, and, and just story after story, families suing each other over estates when, when a, the, the parent or grandparent died, and, and you think, how could people be so vile? Oh, it's easy. <laughs> it's natural. They don't even have to try, and they can be that kind of bad. And so Job is in this wrestling, and what we're going to see these next couple of Sunday nights before we wrap it up is Job is moving into a very dangerous spot of saying, I don't deserve this. This is not fair. Not fair is Phyllis Vitanza when I walked into her home many years ago, and her husband, we knew Tom was going to die any day, and and just been down visiting, and her son Tommy, uh, the, he's a very successful attorney in the city, and he was out that day, and, and when I walked into the house, um, Tom, the dad had just died, Tommy sitting by his bed, had had a heart attack and fallen over his dad, and she walked into the bedroom, and there her husband and her firstborn child were dead when she walked into the room. I think, man, this is, you know, the paramedics came and they said, look, we got to get these guys separated because his wife doesn't need to walk in and see both these people. And, and um, you, know, you look at that and think, no one deserves that. Well, no one does deserve that. But don't accuse him. Don't accuse him. He's a just God. And everything's going to be all right. I can't defend myself before a holy God. If you go down to verse 22. Um, still in chapter, chapter 9, verse 22, this one thing, therefore I said it, he destroyeth the perfect and the wicked. Have you ever tried to explain why you're going through what you're going through? I mean, to yourself, even if not to somebody else. Why am I facing this? And, 
And the smartest thing to do is just say, I'm a mess and you're merciful and help me make it. And just be, be still. But, but this is human. God, God recorded all this because it's us. And you may not have chapter 9, but you got chapter 10. And so he says there in, in verse 22, the fact is, the bad and the good get hurt, and they do. Didn't Stephen get killed after his first sermon? What did he do wrong? James was beheaded. What did he do wrong? He was, he was the, the preacher there in Jerusalem. He was beheaded. And uh, Absalom, he died out in the field, dark, you know, hung up by his long hair in the woods, and they threw spear. The, the, the wicked and the righteous die. And good, the rain falls on the just and the unjust. Verse 27, he says, if I say, I'll forget my complaint. Now, here's what, here's what some of you do, especially some of you that are real, you're just real strong. Verse 27, if I say, I'll forget my complaint. I'll leave off my heaviness. I'll just say, it's all right. This is life and it's okay. Be very careful because probably that hurt is there to teach you. And he says in verse 28, I'm afraid of all my sorrows. I know that thou wilt not hold me innocent. <laughs> he said in verse 27, if I just tried to pretend like it's okay to be, I, it doesn't everybody live in a cardboard box? It's okay to talk to cracks in the sidewalk. What's wrong with it? But there's a day you're going to face God. And um, you, you can't be tough enough to resist when God is working on you. Because what we're looking at is a holy God working on a sinful man. And though Job was a righteous and upright man, we'll see in the next couple of chapters, Job had to address his self-righteousness. And it's a dangerous thing. You've done well in your growing up, and you've done well in your marriage and your family, and you've done well in your business world, and you've got your money in order. It's very dangerous to start thinking how good you are. Because God will help you realize how good you aren't. And he'll bring us to our knees because God won't share his glory with anybody. Go down to verse 30. If I wash myself with snow water and make my hands never so clean, yet thou shalt plunge me in a ditch and my own clothes shall abhor me. He said, no matter how good I try to be, when I get before you, I'm just, I'm in a sewer. I'm just a mess. I'm a wreck. Verse 33 Neither is there a daysman betwixt us that I might lay his hand upon us both. Now, here's what he's talking about. He said, I can't defend myself because he's strong and I'm weak. No matter how smart I am, he's smarter. No matter how I justify myself, he's more just. So I know what he does is right, but if I try to, if I just try to get myself real clean, I'm still dirty. You ever wash a window and then you see how dirty the other side is? And as, as, as you try to get clean, the, the, tell you, the closer you get to God, the more you'll realize how close you are not to God. And he says, I'm, I'm just a man. It'd be like God dipping me in a sewer and says, let me explain to you how dirty you are. And this is a just man. This is a good man. This is a man. And then in verse 33, I'm, he says, if I could only find a man who could lay his hand on God, and lay his hand on me and help God know how I'm hurting. If there could be a man, because you see, God's never hurt like me. God never lost his child. God never faced the suffering and the abuse and the hatred. And, and, and if only, and he calls him a daysman. That's a great thing. You follow that word through the Bible, it points to Jesus over and over and you know, he was prophetically, there's a day coming when Jesus is going to reach out to God the Father and say, I'm in all points tempted like as you are yet without sin. And I do know how you feel. And I do know how you hurt. And I do know what it feels like to be rejected. And I do know what it feels like to be abused. And I'm talking to the Father on your behalf right now. And see, there's so much, there's no gospel, clear gospel in Job, but it gets as close as you're going to find anywhere. As Job just makes this thing very clear, verse 35, if, if I could get this daysman, and he, the daysman in verse 34, down to verse 33, would verse 34, let him take his rod away from me and let, it, and let not his fear terrify me. 
sometimes, and, and if you're in that young, innocent Christian stage where, where you just know everything's okay and you're, and you're not worried what God might do, the day will come when he'll humble you. And you get up and think, oh God, have mercy on me. And those days come, might be through your job, might be through your family, verse 35, then would I speak and not fear him? If I could get that daysman, if I could get that daysman so we could know, so I could know God and God could know me and, and I could know that he feels what I feel and hurts like I hurt. If I could know that, verse 35, then, then I could talk to him. And I wouldn't have to be afraid. And I want to assure you today, you don't have to be afraid. Whatever your circumstances, whatever you're facing, you have a daysman. And he does know you're hurt. And and many of you, most of you here, um, half of you at least, you've got children, many of you adult children, and we worry for our kids. And, you know, for our children, when our kids cried, I was concerned. But I'm much more concerned about my grandchildren crying because my kids aren't as wise as I am. <laughs> and, um, I mean, if my kids had a problem, they deserved it. But if my grandkids had a problem, that's Josiah. I don't know. And um, you know how, fool, how foolish we are. But he says there in verse, verse 35, I wouldn't, have, I wouldn't have to fear because I know he understands. And I know he knows. Now let's jump into chapter 10. Chapter 10, so Job is still talking. Job's going through the very things. And I believe in Job, God is picking up all of the hurts that you feel and he's writing them. Job 10, 1, my soul is weary of life. Remember Paul said to the Philippian people, if for me to depart and be with Christ should be better. Paul said, I'd really rather die than, than keep living. But for you, it's needful. So Job says in chapter 10, verse 1, my soul is weary. I will leave my complaint upon myself. I'll speak in the bitterness of my soul. I'm bitter. I'm angry. And then look at, look at how he, he kind of gets open. Do you ever get really open with God? Verse 3, is it good? that thou should oppress, that thou should despise the work of thine hands and shine upon the counsel of the wicked? Hast thou eyes of flesh? Seest thou as men see? Here Job saying, look God, do you understand what you're doing to me? And what a good God. Did he let Job, remember Jeremiah's down in that prison cell. Jeremiah, he's sick of it. And you might be at that, that point. You might get at that point one day, or you might have been at that point. And Jeremiah just said, I'm done. I'm not preaching. I am done. God says, really? Yeah, really, I'm done. And a while later, Job says, or Jeremiah says, well, maybe I'm not done. <laughs> God knows you're hurt. And God knows sometimes you say stupid things. I remember one of our men, a good man, he's in heaven now, but he called me up one day, we were talking, and he'd had some burdens that I've never faced. And, and uh, he said, oh, this and this and this. And this. I, just, I just got mad at God. I just went to open the back door of the house and threw my Bible out in the backyard. I said, really? He said, yep. I said, what did you do then? He said, I went out and got it. <laughs> we have a merciful God, a patient God. Look down at chapter 10, verse 4. He says, he's, he's really almost accusing him. Hast thou eyes of flesh? Seest thou as man seeth? Uh, verse 6, that thou inquirest after my iniquity and searchest after my sin. Look, God, you know who I am. Why are you pointing out my weakness here? And, and uh, verse 7, thou knowest that I'm not wicked. And there, there is none that can deliver out of thine hand. He fills the whole spectrum. You know I've tried to do right, and you know I can't save myself. That's the whole spectrum of the pendulum right there in that one verse. Verse 15, if I be wicked, woe to me. If I be righteous, yet will I not lift up my head. Remember where he was just a chapter ago? He was lifting up himself. Now he says, yeah, no, I better not. If I'm wicked, you know, and if I'm righteous, I can't be proud of it. I'm full of confusion, the end of verse 15. I'm full of confusion, therefore see thou mine affliction. He just goes to God and says, look, I don't even know what to think. Have you, have you ever come to the spot where you don't even know which way to go? 
and you, you look around and think, God, you brought me, you, you brought me to a spot where I don't know which way to turn. And none of us want to be there, but I can tell you when you get to that spot, that may be when you're closest to the Lord. Because when you got nowhere to turn to, if you can just go work a few more hours to pay that bill, if you can get that new specialist to take care of the medication to this problem, if uh, you can go to that person, talk to him and get the situation right. But when you've got nowhere to go and you just sit down and say, I can't do anything. I think God comes and sits down right next to you and says, that's good. Good for us to talk a little bit here. Now, God's not done dealing with this situation. We've got a couple more chapters. Um, we're not going to go through them, but verse 15 is not a bad place to sit. I don't know where to go. I'm full of confusion. Therefore, see thou my affliction. You know what you can rest in tonight? He sees your loneliness. He sees your question mark. He sees, and, and you might say, yeah, but my problem I caused it. What problem didn't you cause? <laughs> well, this problem my brother caused, or my parents, or my government. Yeah, but you know what? How, you know how many problems we have that we caused? When he saved you, he didn't say, all right, I died for your, I died for your sins, but not for the ones you did on purpose. He died for all our sins, didn't he? And when he comes to help his child, he comes to help you with all your problems. You can sit there in confusion and say, I don't even know where to go. I don't even know what to do. That's a good spot. Just sit there and wait on God because he'll see you through. All right, Father, help us tonight as we consider a little more this very unusual man and a life none of us want to live, but all of us admire. And I pray you'd help us. There's some young people here who it'll be a decade before they walk this valley. Maybe two decades. I pray you'd put some of these truths in their heart. And for all of us that we would, that we would step into this world of surrender. Not to arguing with you about whether you're right or not, but just surrender. Help us to be near to you in our confusion and in our sorrow. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand just for a moment of invitation before we close.